Today's video is sponsored by Shaker and Spoon. More about them in a bit. Despite a seemingly impossible size and complexity, the universe is a pretty simple place. The entire universe is governed by a few simple forces, each able to be represented by a single short equation. No matter how complicated the world around us may seem, scientists have been able to describe different things in great detail with one simple goal in mind unification. Around the turn of the 19th century, one group of scientists were studying electricity. Another group of scientists were trying to answer the question, what the f***s up with magnets? At that point, it was believed that electricity and magnetism, two unrelated forces in the universe. But that changed in 1820 when Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that an electrical wire hooked up to a battery could deflect the needle in a nearby compass. Since then, theories surrounding electricity and magnetism were unified to describe a single electromagnetic force. Being able to unify theories like these is important because at the most basic level, the universe seems like it should make sense. That's not to say that every scientific theory should be able to be combined into a single theory represented by the number 42, but things should still make sense. Now, there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge of the universe still, but two of the most important theories are general relativity and quantum mechanics. All modern physics is built upon one of these two theories. That's because they make sense. They work, and they're kind of simple. Simple here being a relative term when it comes to quantum mechanics, but, but its underlying equations describing the forces that govern our universe are short, which is what matters. Now, so far, I'm sure all of this sounds brilliant, but there is an absolutely massive problem. General relativity and quantum mechanics do not get along. Relativity deals with the biggest things in the universe and gives exact Act, deterministic answers. Quantum mechanics deals with the smallest things in the universe and gives probabilistic answers. There's also the problem of time, where the two theories treat time as something completely different and indeed contradictory. But to understand a theory of everything, first we need to understand what exactly it is that we're trying to unify. Now, just before we continue with today's video, I want to tell you about one of my absolute favorite sponsors, because it's a sponsor that provides cocktails to me. Have you ever wanted to impress a date? with a fancy cocktail, or maybe just throw an unforgettable party with your friends. Well, have no fear, because Shaker and Spoon is here. This is a Shaker and Spoon box, and it's a monthly cocktail subscription service that delivers the craft cocktail experience right to your door. This is the tequila box, and obviously, I'm at work right now with it, but through the magic of technology, there will be clips of me tech with this box at home later, getting a little bit of a buzz on while I make some tequila cocktails. It's gonna be a good time. I'm already excited about it. It is far too long until the workday ends. <laughs> Each month you receive a box with three unique recipes crafted by world-class bartenders. They come in this neat little booklet here telling you exactly how to make it. And each box makes up to 12 cocktails. What you do, all you need to do is provide the bottle of tequila and they provide everything else. Tequila is easy to get, but all of these little things like Woodster bitters and hibiscus lemon rosemary syrup. They even got this giant beaver tree pink grapefruit drink and cilantro jalapeno syrup. Look, there's tons of little things in here and these little boxes, you'll see these better with me making them up at home. What's this? Bibiscus salt toasted coconut flakes. Look, it's obviously very, very fancy stuff. The best part is you get to learn about spirits and flavor combinations that you may have never tried before. Plus, you no longer need to seek out hard to find cocktail ingredients or buy full bottles of things that you only use once. Like my cupboard before Shaker and Spoon was full of like random stuff that I'm never gonna use again because I wanted to make one cocktail one time. The instructions are clear, five minutes to make it and you're good to go. It's also fun to make it. It's not like, you know, cooking something and you're like, oh God, really, it's gonna take an hour. It's just like, boom, pour it out and you're good to go. And guess what? I've got a special treat for you. Use the code T-S-O-S-F for science of science fiction. You can see what we did there. And go to shakerandspoon.com slash T-S-O-S-F or click the link below to get $20 off your subscription. It's a really great thing. I love Shaker and Spoon. Cheers to you. And now back to today's video. Gravity Falls. According to the tale told by Isaac Newton himself on many occasions, it all began with an apple. 
After seeing an apple fall off of a tree, he began to wonder why. Why did the apple always fall perpendicular to the ground? Why couldn't it fly upward or at least fall at some sort of slanted angle? From there, he began working on the theory of gravity, not only as an explanation for the apple, but to provide a justification for Kepler's laws of planetary motion. To us, it might seem very obvious that gravity works both on Earth and on a cosmic scale. But back in the 1660s, this was completely groundbreaking stuff. It's why you've heard of Isaac Newton. At the time, there had been no reason to believe that an apple falling from a tree could be related to the Earth's orbit around the sun. The two things seemed so disparate that there was no reason to believe that they were somehow connected. And this, once again, brings us back to the idea of unification. The laws of planetary motion were known, and people were gaining an increased understanding of how gravity worked, but Newton was the first to unify them by describing a single gravitational force that could be measured uh, with the equation that you're seeing on the screen. Now, this single tiny equation explained why planets revolve around stars, why the moon orbits the Earth, and why apples fall straight down off of trees. Like we said at the beginning of this episode, the universe is surprisingly simple. In this equation, m sub 1 and m sub 2 are the masses of two objects. R is the distance between their centers of mass, and g is the gravitational constant. So this equation measures the gravitational force between any two objects in the universe. And for a long time, this equation it was fantastic. It's actually still a pretty great equation, and if you took an introductory physics course in school, then you almost certainly used this equation because for most cases, the answer you'll get is close enough. But Newton was eventually superseded by Einstein and his theory of relativity. So there was a tiny discrepancy in Mercury's orbit that could not be explained by Newton's laws unless there was some other celestial body near Mercury that uh, we were yet to see. Einstein's theory of general relativity was able to correct for this discrepancy by describing gravity not as a force, but as the warping of space-time as a result of mass. This new model was not only able to predict the same thing that Newton was to an increased level of accuracy, it was also able to explain many things that had remained questions under Newton, like Mercury's orbits. It also predicted things like gravitational time dilation and gravitational waves, both of which have since been confirmed. Though gravity was technically no longer a force per se, it is still considered one of the four fundamental forces of the universe. But gravity only really applies when we're talking about the biggest things in the universe, like stars, planets, and apples. I'm sure you might not think that an apple counts as one of the biggest things in the universe, but an apple is still one octillion times larger than the largest things dealt with by General Relativity's arch nemesis, quantum mechanics. Richard Feynman famously stated, I think I can safely say that nobody really understands quantum mechanics. But let's give it a crack, shall we? Besides, Feynman's quote is from a book back in 1964 and was mostly being played for laughs, so maybe people have a better grasp of the concepts today. While gravity describes how nature works on a scale that is large enough for us to perceive with the naked eye, quantum mechanics describes how nature works at the atomic and subatomic level. Gravity is absent from quantum mechanics because the masses involved are tiny, and because gravity is a over 30 orders of magnitude weaker than the other forces. Any effect of gravity would be completely negligible when dealing with matter at the atomic level. Instead, quantum mechanics focuses on the other three fundamental forces. Electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is, as you might have guessed, the strongest of the fundamental forces. It is what binds subatomic particles together. The weak nuclear force describes the interaction between subatomic particles, as well as being responsible for things like the radioactive decay of atoms, nuclear fission, and nuclear fusion. Finally, electromagnetism deals with how particles of an electrical charge interact with one another. Just like general relativity was able to, quantum mechanics is able to make predictions that have been verified to an extremely high degree of accuracy. Even though these predictions are probabilistic and do not guarantee an outcome with 100% certainty, they are extremely reliable and have been confirmed through experimentation time and time again. However, there was something very interesting that was discovered thanks to some unexpected experiment results. Chinese-American physicist Chen Xiongwu led an experiment to demonstrate the conservation of parity as it applied to the weak nuclear force. We don't really need to worry about what the conservation of parity actually is right now, but it's a thing that was already established to have existed in both the electromagnetic and strong nuclear forces. But much to Wu's surprise, the conservation of parity was violated by the weak nuclear force in the experiments. These shocking results led to a bit of a mad dash to explain what happened and how the electromagnetic and weak interactions were related to one another. I'm trying to figure this out. Scientists 
scientists realized that not only could they relate electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force, they could unify them into the electroweak force. At low energy levels, the kind at which most experiments would be run, these two forces seem to be completely unrelated. But at high enough energy levels, such as when the temperature is 10 to the power of 15 Kelvin or more, the two forces merged into a single unified force. This meant that theoretically, they were always the same force. This theory led to numerous predictions that would take decades to finally prove, but thanks to super colliders, everything that was predicted by the electroweak force has been confirmed. This was one of several reasons that the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012 was so important, as it was the final piece that was needed to all but confirm the electroweak force. But as it turns out, we can extend this theory out even further. If electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force are the same single force at high enough energy levels, then why don't we just crank this shit up to 11 and add in the strong nuclear force as well? Hell, if you could create an energetic enough system, then even gravity should combine with these forces to create one universal force. If we could prove that that was true, it should be a huge step to creating a unified theory for all of physics. Right? Well, if we could prove it, then sure, it would be this huge step. Theoretically, it should be true, but in order to actually test that theory, we would need to build a super collider that was, wait for it, a thousand light years in diameter. That's a little bit of a hiccup because we can't do that yet. Proposed theories. There are a number of different proposed theories of everything that try to reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics. Some of them you might have heard of, such as loop quantum gravity, and others are a little bit more obscure, like the EB theory. Now, we're not going to get into all of these theories in today's video because they're extremely complicated and they require being able to imagine various geometric structures existing in 11 dimensional space, <laughs> which is a thing. But we do, of course, need to at least touch on string theory. String theory is the most well known and most popular of the theories of everything. The the general idea is that if you look really, really closely at the tiniest particles in the universe, those particles are actually one-dimensional strings. This is only visible at the string scale, and when observed from any other scale, they look like ordinary particles as described by particle physics. These strings can exist in a number of different vibrational states, with each state corresponding to a different particle. The theory also includes a theoretical graviton particle, a particle that would carry the gravitational force. It is through these gravitons that strings theory introduces the mechanics of quantum gravity, thus making it a theory of everything. It obviously gets a lot more complicated than that, but there are already two problems with this theory anyway. First, the strings are unfathomably small. They are so small that they would appear as particles no matter what sort of instruments we use to analyze them. Being impossible to observe is a pretty big problem, but it's not an insurmountable one. We know black holes exist, even though by their very definition they are impossible to see. The existence of black holes was proven through indirect observation observation rather than direct observation, and this is a pretty common practice in science. However, string theory doesn't provide us with anything indirect that we can observe. General relativity and quantum mechanics have proven themselves to be the two best theories we have for understanding how the natural world works because of the high level of accuracy of their predictions. If a theory can consistently result in accurate predictions, it creates strong evidence in support of that theory. But string theory doesn't actually predict anything. Some will argue that it's only because the theory is thus far incomplete, but it doesn't change the fact that string theory is completely untestable and thus unfalsifiable. This lack of testable predictions is a common trend among theories of everything. And it is one of the reasons that many scientists believe that a theory of everything simply doesn't exist. The search for a theory of everything began over a century ago. And in that time, the likes of Kurt Gödel, Freeman Dyson, and Stephen Hawking have all come out saying that no such theory should be possible. Why unification matters. Now you hopefully understand exactly what it is we're trying to unify. Why is this so important to physics? The most basic answer is that if we have one theory for how matter works with big things and one for how it works with small things, it'd be really nice if they were, you know, compatible with one another. They're both great at what they do, but the maths is incompatible. That's not to say that either theory is necessarily wrong. There's something incomplete about them. There is no experimental evidence that shows general relativity and quantum mechanics directly contradict one another, but there are certain 
certain things that we want to study that will require using both systems. It is in these instances, such as studying the singularity inside a black hole, uh, we would need both the subatomic details from quantum mechanics and the gravitational effects of general relativity to work in harmony. And that's something we haven't figured out how to achieve. But bringing up black holes gets us to the real crux of why a theory of everything is important. There are a lot of open questions in physics, and it is believed that a theory of everything would allow us to solve most or even all of these problems. Questions ranging from what happens in the center of a black hole all the way to what was the universe doing before the Big Bang. These could all be potentially answered by such a theory. Of course, that's also what makes a unified theory so difficult to achieve. We're essentially taking every difficult question in physics and trying to answer them all simultaneously. That is an extremely daunting task and one that many physicists don't even believe is possible. If those physicists are wrong, however, discovering a theory of everything would be completely invaluable for furthering our understanding of the universe. And if it's as simple as the formula for Newton's universal law of gravitation, then we could someday live in a world where the singular equation that describes the interactions of all matter in the universe could fit on a bumper sticker. And as nerdy as that may sound, it would still be cooler than 90% of bumper stickers that you've ever seen. Thanks for watching.